reject all the gifts from you So I honor your blessing by blessing the way you do Hi, welcome to session five and today we're going to look at the parable of the talents yeah. which is about more than just money, right? Right, it's, it's really about what God gives us. It's more about the steward and how he handles the, the resources God has given us. So we're thinking, particularly in this message and in this discussion, we're thinking about you know, a person's capacity, their experiences, whether it's in the church, outside the church, their education, um, their, their passions and abilities, spiritual gifts, natural talents, right. you bring all that to the table. All those things are gifts from God to us. And as stewards, what are we going to do with those things? That's really at the heart of this parable for us. It's an important one for us. Yeah. Um, when this parable is interesting because this one comes later in Jesus' ministry. So talk about that. What's the context for this parable? Well, this parable is in a section in Matthew that really focuses on future judgment. And um, there are a lot of strong warnings in this, and this is one of those warnings, is we don't want to be like the third servant who squandered what the master had given him. We don't want to squander what God has given us. Once you come to Jesus as Savior and you begin to understand everything in your life, again, going back to James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, then you say, wait a minute, that education I got, I might say my parents or I paid for it or the Pell Grant paid <laughs> for it or whatever you want to say, but no, that's a gift from God. And the, the career experiences, even the things you've been able to do in church, I know even the stuff I did as a teenager in my local church, I look back and say, wow, God was using that to prepare me to even speak and preach and be a pastor. And, and we, we have a stewardship of those things that we are going to be held accountable to the master one day. And there's a warning. We want to uh, use those things well. And even at times, as this parable implies, take risk in the Christian life knowing that the master wants us to use those things and he will graciously receive us even if we do encounter risk in this. So in the story, there's three servants mm -hmm. and they're all given different amounts. Yes. And which Five, kind of, two, one. Right, which kind of mimics real life. We all have different capacities right. and, and different skills and things we've been given. Yeah, there's, and, and there's no, um, the amounts don't tell you anything about how the master values each servant. Right, right. Each servant is equally valued but they're given different gifts. And the same thing within the body of Christ and as human beings, we're all different and wired different. You and I are different. We have some places we overlap. We know each other well enough. And then we have areas where you definitely are much more gifted in areas I'm not, and I appreciate you for that. And that's part of the beauty of the body of Christ, even going to the image of the body. You know, somebody's the hand, somebody's the eye. Every part is important, but we're all endowed with different responsibilities and, and ways in which we're to be stewards for the Lord. The first two guys, though, they do the same. And it's the third guy who does it differently. It's interesting because you don't know the relationship, right, between right. the master and these servants. But clearly, there's a communication issue or a relational difference between how the first two regard the master and what the third does. Can you talk about that? The first two seem to really understand the master. They understand his expectations, how he operates. They know him. They've leaned into a relationship with him. The third one seems to be more distant from the master. They see him, he sees him as judgmental, he's right. worried, okay. he's gripped by fear, he doesn't want to risk, he doesn't want to attempt to uh, use the resources he's been given. It'd be better just to bury it and hand the same thing back to the master when he comes back because I wouldn't have risked anything. But he doesn't seem to have a relationship with the master and understand what the master's expectations were and, and that the master would even show a little grace because the risk is a part of that stewardship. And I, I meet people who try to avoid the risk of, well, I don't want to get involved because, yeah, I've got this background and this training, but I don't know how that would work in a church setting. And I, you know, I don't know. And, and they're nervous about the risk. Well, the more you know the Lord, the better the steward you're going to be of whatever God has given you. So the risk is one piece of it, right? So there's the fear of, I might not get a good return on investment. These other guys, these two got 100% return, and that's right. amazing. Okay, what if I did it and I didn't um, get a return? But I think there's another piece of it, because Jesus calls him wicked and slothful. So yeah. there's a laziness, right? Right. The warning is also about, he didn't, maybe he didn't want to work. And the, the wicked part, too, I think maybe that angle is is maybe there were clearer expectations than the story tells us. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, they were to invest it, and he thought, well, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to, one, I'm going to be lazy. It's easier just to bury this thing. Yes. <laughs> and when the master comes back, dig it back up and hand it to him, so I've done nothing in the time he's gone. 
The others seem to be finding ways to invest it and some money comes back from this investment and so then they invest it in this and a little more comes back. I don't think it was just one investment comes back and they double their money. This seems to be they're working. They might they're even working. be, right. I don't know how long it's gone. It may even be they take the money and buy seeds and plant crop and they got right. a harvest. We don't know all the details right. about what's going on. But obviously, this is not just like they put it in a CD and sat around like, <laughs> that's why this isn't just about money. This is right. more about what God has given us inside of us and who we are and our experiences. I think it's interesting in our context that sometimes I wish God would just tell me, Carolyn, I want you to do X, yeah. right? Um, but God doesn't need to micromanage us necessarily in that way. And when it comes to, uh, you know, ministries or places where we can invest, like it's more, I think we get to work that out with the Lord together and try different things. Yes. Um, and I think sometimes we think, oh, we want to know we're going to be successful in a particular ministry. I'm not good with kids. I don't know if I want to try that. But then if you volunteer maybe one Sunday and check it out, like there's, then you learn what you like and also what you don't like. And, and you w others will help affirm that. Say, true, wow, true. you're really connecting here in this ministry. I think even of our small group leaders and the leaders of the groups, you know, I bet a lot of them got into this thinking, I don't know if I can lead another this group in Bible true. study and prayer. And what if someone I've brings up this idea or yeah. this theology or we have a disagreement? How am I going to? And so thank you for those of you who are leading, for taking the risk to actually lead a group like you're leading. And you're taking the experiences and the opportunity. That's a part of the stewardship when we have opportunities mm -hmm. to serve in the body and a lot of people here we need volunteers for this or well, we need people to join this team or go through this training and it's incredible uh, when you get plugged into ministry like I think the first two stewards discovered it's a joy right. and a privilege to be used by God. I know when I first started to preach or teach just a couple weeks ago or cleaning out the garage and that we came across the first two messages I ever preached. Oh, wow. One I'm 16 and the other I'm 17 <laughs> wow. in my home church and I'm so thankful for those people who were so patient and loving and kind to me at Twin Branch Bible Church. But I remember how nervous I was because I thought maybe this isn't what I'm wired for. Maybe this isn't, I just don't know if this is going to work. But encouragement and development of others and they poured into me. I came away from those going, wow, maybe that wasn't the best and I'm pretty young and I got a lot to learn. But I'm excited that God can use who I am, how he's wired me, what he's given me, the abilities, the preparation, the background. So the third servant, sad story for him. Yes, he gets even story. what little he has gets taken away. And it seems like the crux of his problem really is that he does not understand the character of the master. No, he doesn't get it. Doesn't know him, doesn't have a real relationship with him. And I think he's gripped, uh, it, rather than having confidence and faith and joy in the master, he has fear, he has worries, he's gripped by, well, what if it doesn't work out? What if something happens? And I think being called Lazy also means maybe he's not completely worried about all that. He's just more like, eh, I see what you guys are doing. I'm sitting over here and I'm going to, you know, have some iced tea and wait till the master comes back and it doesn't matter. And uh, that's very dangerous. Spectator Christianity is not the Christianity of the Bible. And when we don't use the gifts God given us, we don't use our abilities and our talents for him, we become like that servant. And it, it, it is not a sweet experience with the master then, with our Lord and Savior. Is a warning that you use it or you lose it? I think that some of it, or you, 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 you miss the benefit of, of enjoying the gift God has given you and being able to use him. There's a, an old hymn, I know I quote a lot of old <laughs> hymns, but there's an old hymn that I still sing to myself. It was a song that said, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And I think the first two, uh, servants, as they're serving him, even while he's away, the sweeter their relationship with the owner of the household uh, grows. But the other guy doesn't get to experience that. So it's not even what is taken away, that's part of this, but it's what they never get to experience. This, this guy never gets to experience, he never gets the advantage of. And so I would hope that when we take those abilities, education, experiences, gifts, talents that God has given us, our time, the capacity, all those things, I would hope that as we serve within the body and in the community as the servants of Jesus Christ, that we find the longer we serve him and the more we use what he's given us, the sweeter he grows. 
you know, we encourage our small groups to not just depend on the leader to do everything, but to figure out what their gifts things sure. are, what their passions are, um, and it's it, it becomes sweeter because then they get to bring their gifts to the table too and get to do some of those things and grow in those ways. And by the way, the, the small groups and the group you're in becomes a microcosm of what the whole body of Christ known yes. as Calvary is supposed to be. And then it becomes, that becomes a microcosm of what the entire body of Christ uh, from the time of the day of Pentecost when the church started till Jesus comes for his bride, the body of Christ uh, is supposed to be, like we talked about, this one body, different parts functioning in different ways using the gifts and abilities God's given us. And I think probably most of the small groups can identify with that. I know in my small group, we have a person who's emerged as a prayer warrior. Yes. We have uh, someone who's more the organizer. And you can just see the, as, as each part of our small group, well, Leslie and I can see that with the others that are in our group, the more we allow them to use their gifts and abilities, the more blessed they are, the more blessed we are, and the more glorified God is. And that's so important. And one of the dangers of having experience, education, capacity, time, skills, abilities, gifts, and not using it, one of the great dangers is what you lose out on, but it's also what others lose out on. So sometimes we don't want to ask people to do something at church that they normally do as part of their jobs because we're like, they do that for 40, 60 hours. You know, maybe they don't want to be doing that here. And recently I heard a cool story about one of our security um, team members yeah. that is in that sort of a role in his employment. And he just, he wanted to use those gifts to protect our church and protect our kids and kind of make sure our systems were all up and running well. And I thought how cool he gets to use something that he normally does that we would have to pay a professional to, to serve um, and help us out with, but he's doing it to volunteer his time, and he's finding great joy in doing that. Right, and he, he I think I know that story. We, we, you and I heard uh, the, the story together, and the individual said, it would be such a shame for me to have all this experience and background in law enforcement and then not be a part of the security emergency response team at my church so that I can use all that for the Lord. And that attitude is tremendous. Now, I know some people, I've met, I think it depends on the individual too, by the way. I have met some people who will say, you know, I do, I do this all day long, and there are certain components to that that I can bring into this setting, but it, I don't have to be on that exact thing that matches it, but I can use that experience in this role that's different, right. but it, it informs me, it inspires me, it like helps Like teachers, me. we have some, some of our small group leaders are actually teachers You're by right. profession. They don't want to work with children at our church because they do that all the but time. But they're willing to lead but a But they love group. to use those gifts. And that comes into play. That comes into right. play. It's more about, I think this parable, one of the things we miss, we get caught up sometimes in the, the numbers, you know, five to one. The return on investment, yes. We, we get caught up in uh, how each is judged or not. But I think the, the broader picture is pretty simplistic. And that is, and that's usually Jesus is trying to take complex things and bring them down to a simple point. And the simple point is, our Lord has given us abilities, gifts, talents, experiences, education that we cannot squander. We must risk those things, invest those things, and leverage those things for His glory. And we do, when we do, it brings deep satisfaction to us as we use what He's given us. It brings deep satisfaction to those who are impacted by our using those things, and it brings satisfaction and glory to our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. So Sean, this parable ends with a very stark warning, mm -hmm. because the last servant is separated from God forever. Right. Um, so does this mean that unless we produce or do these works and multiply our gifts in some way that God is going to be separating himself from us? No, no, not at all. Matter of fact, we know from the scope of Scripture that um, our relationship with God is not based on our good works. As a matter of fact, I think the indication here is that this servant, the, the servant who is cast off forever, he doesn't even have a relationship with the Master or the Lord. And because he doesn't have the relationship, he is cast off. And the, the proof that he has no relationship is he doesn't want to do what pleases him. Mm -hmm. But you look at the other two, they obviously have a relationship with the master because they do what will please him. So we know that once we come to Jesus, Paul says, then the fruit of the Spirit comes out in right. us. 
Paul tells the Ephesian believers that once we come to Jesus as Savior, then good works flow. They're not the requirement for us to have a relationship with God, but they are the result of the relationship. And so that third servant doesn't even have a real true relationship with the master. It looked like he did, but it's obvious he doesn't, and that's why he goes to judgment. The other two have the relationship, and how they invest what God has given them to steward is evidence of the relationship with the master. Same thing in our lives. Good and perfect are the gifts from you. So I honor your blessing by blessing the way you do.